Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director at the Institute. Over the last number of years, bargaining has changed in a whole variety of ways, and we're very lucky this, in this edition to have a conversation with Jack Callacy. Jack is the Director of Collective Bargaining and Organizing for the United Nurses and Allied Professionals. Jack, I'd like to welcome you to Labor Vision. Thank you, Bob. The organized labor has changed. The whole method of collective bargaining has changed somewhat in the last 25 years. Um, without telling your age, without telling our age, We've been around for a long time. We've seen those changes take place. Before we begin to talk about the changes in collective bargaining, particularly as it applies to the hospitals, tell me a little bit about Jack Callacy, the work that you've do, uh, done, the work that you've done in the past, because I think you were with the uh, Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals for a number of years and then helped to organize this whole union for UNEP. Right, well, well the, um, uh, when I w went to work for the, the uh, FNHP, they were, um, 400 registered nurses under contract in a couple of hospitals. So um, there was virtually no union density and um, uh, it was a very, very, um, very, very simple operation at that point. And one of the things that became uh, apparent immediately was to have any influence in the industry or on the more important issues of the day that we would have to build our union for, to, for uh, greater density and uh, more power. How many nurses do you represent today? Uh, we represent, our total membership is 6,500, and um, uh, we're very proud of the fact that, that um, we represent uh, all forms of healthcare workers. So for example, at the West, Westerly Hospital, we represent everybody from A to Z. So you know, I would say probably 70% of our members are registered nurses, but um, we've expanded our membership base to include uh, all healthcare workers. Keeping that in mind, knowing that <clears throat> you've watched the transition with healthcare workers and with nurses, let's talk about the hospitals over the last 15 years. There's been a, a significant change. Because my understanding that there were a lot of standalone individual hospitals 15 years ago in Rhode Island. Well, virtually every hospital was a nonprofit, community based hospital. And there weren't, there weren't systems, uh, each community had their own hospital. And as we speak, uh, virtually every community hospital in Rhode Island is either part of something else or about to become part of a larger system, every single one. What impact does that have on the, what impact does it have on the hospitals and what impact does it have on you as a organizer and, and, and individually negotiating contracts? Well, you know, obviously I'm not a, a hospital spokesman, and, uh, but I, you know, I think that the overwhelming pressures for a lowering costs have, have caused hospitals um, to go to different business models and to feel that they have to become part of bigger systems. So, uh, for example, um, taking on more risk or getting into contracts that perhaps would have uh, capitation uh, or dealing with insurers um, or dealing with the Affordable Care Act and all the changes, the hospitals have felt the, the, the pressures not only in Rhode Island but nationwide to form into bigger and bigger <coughs> systems. And, and that's what, what's really driving, what has driven uh, the consolidation. And I would even uh, say that, that I think that even though every hospital, community hospital belongs to a bigger system now, I think you're gonna see this, the, the systems merge into systems. So I don't think we've seen the end of it. Is that a national trend? It is. So having those individual hospitals, <clears throat> excuse me, merge into collective units and, and, and even those mergers becoming other mergers. How does that, what impact does that have on you negotiating contracts? It has a dramatic effect. And um, uh, you know, just to talk about what I would uh, affectionately refer to as the good old days, you know, uh, life was fairly simple. There was a hospital in, in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, Woonsocket Hospital, and we organized the hospital. And the bargaining relationship was our union at the Woonsocket Hospital and the Woonsocket Hospital. And, uh, 
likewise at Memorial Hospital in Westerly and, and Rhode Island Hospital in Fatima, so that the union was organized both um, politically and, f and for bargaining purposes with relatively small independent local union and small independent hospital. And so just by way of example, uh, you know, the, the Woonsocket Hospital local, which is now Landmark, um, there was no need to be part of something uh, bigger, and so we set the locals up as independent entities to, to uh, c conduct their affairs with that hospital. And now, of course, the, the uh, employer model is really different and, and, quite frankly, makes the union model that I just described to you obsolete. Knowing that it makes the model obsolete, in the same way technology has changed many things that happen in a classroom, many things that happen in a hospital, do you think that that merger mentality has made, the, made it less personal? You know, we all know in collective bargaining, there are, it's, it is about relationships, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad and sometimes they're difficult, but you can always get through it. Has it changed the way you negotiate? It hasn't, it hasn't changed in terms of the personal dynamics. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, uh, good working relationships with, for example, Employer Labor Council or um, HR relationships that, that hold up. Um, so that doesn't necessarily change, except that you have to recognize the fact that the decision making for that employer is not at that hospital. Like for instance, if, if it's Rhode Island Hospital, it's gonna be more lifespan. If it's at uh, Kent Hospital, it's gonna be more Cairn New England. If it's at uh, the Westley Hospital, it's gonna be more Lawrence Memorial Hospital. So you have to recognize the fact that, that the bargaining dynamic and the decision making has changed more so than the personal relationships. On the surface, the personal relationships still, you know, they, on the surface they are the, appear to be the same, mm -hmm. but the, what's behind the employer uh, organization is very different. How do you see it moving in the future? What do you think is going to happen? I mean, you're saying now some of the larger organizations may end up merging. Right. Well, I think that, that you know, it's the, it's the age old. A dynamic for for a union, you you have to, the union has to change itself to meet the structure of the employer, and so for example, now that Memorial Hospital in Pawtucket is part of uh, Cairn, New England, um, you know we ask ourselves, does the uh, having two separate locals really make sense in 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 one uh, employing entity? Uh, and so to respond to that, for example, we've lined up the contracts to have a, a common expiration date, so we can deal on an equal footing with the employer. And then it pre presents all kinds of new challenges, which is, uh, what, if, what if the employer moves work from one campus to another? I mean, on the one hand, I think you could say, well, let's build six, uh, 12 feet walls of cinder blocks and put ribbon wire on top and keep everything out in and prevent anything from going out, which is a model that I think would be the wrong one. Or you say, you know what? Um, hospitals should be more efficient. We should uh, embrace that. But accordingly, then, we have to negotiate provisions. What happens if the work moves? To, to provide so, uh, the, the right to members to follow their work from one campus to another, for example, and to bring their, their seniority or their pension credits or things like that. So that's a whole other set of challenges that, that the um, new structures bring. It really does force you, though, to look into the future and, and change even the approach on how that bargaining will take place. When you take two contracts and you take and you plan on merging them together, because essentially that's what you're you're looking at, and it sounds like you've even aligned the contracts to end at a particular time. There must be a way that you're looking at contracts to see how do you blend these together. Well, what's a very very tricky thing is is uh, dealing with traditions and history and the politics of the different unions. You know, all of our unions are very good unions. They're very proud unions. They have their own histories and traditions, and their contracts reflect that, and they're very different. So um, when you become, say, for instance, using the example of, uh, of uh, Memorial and Kent, um, those contracts are very different. Now, their common expiration date for the first time will be in June of 2015. Um, so you know, it, it really presents great challenges. Now, you know, it's, it's, I am sure that just as the union has come up with a list of the highest common denominator, I'm sure the employer has come up with the reverse of that list. And so, but I think over time, um, the, I think the trend is gonna pull towards more commonality than the differences. And that, while I don't think that's gonna ever happen in one sitting, I just think over time you're gonna see more um, 
more, more integration, more commonality in the contracts. How do you do that with union leaders? How do you take two locals and begin to move them together? Particularly when you have had a local that had a president and an executive board, and now you need to merge them together. Well, the first thing is, the good thing is that, that um, um, our union is a relatively small independent union, so the local presidents know each other, and that, that's a good beginning. But it's a very difficult task, um, uh, say, uh, at the unit rep level, steward level, or members, to try to get to explain to them, look, the world is really different, and we're going to have to make difficult changes. And, and in, in those changes, you know, everything is not going to go one local's way or another local's way. So I think you just have to be really honest about it. You have to continually explain how things have changed. And I think, uh, for, for at least me personally, really take the responsibility to tell people very directly, look, if you conduct business the way the world was 15 years ago, you're going to get swept away. And there's millions of examples of that. You have to find a way to get ahead of the game and, 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 and really embrace the challenges and, and stay ahead. It's interesting you say that because I think that <clears throat> more often than not, if you were to listen to outside sources describe organized labor, to describe unions, they don't believe we've changed at all. They really believe that unions are the same things now that they were in 1924-25 when we were organizing the manufacturing mills. That's not at all the truth. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and um, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to learn more about um, uh, the industry in, in, in which our members work and, and how they're configured, the, the financial pressures, uh, especially because you have to make a judgment as to you know, um, if you if you know if you represent um, uh, you know the, the horse buggy makers, are you going to simply stand pat and 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 fight that battle and lose, or, or are you going to shift to to you know the automobile? And and so we spend a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of effort really studying the changes, and 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 we've done so for you know 25 years now. Where do you see us? What describe UNAP for me? based on where you think it's going to be, describe that statewide union for nurses and allied professionals 10 years from now. Well, I, I hope that, um, I like the last 10 years and the 10 years before that and the 10 years before that, I hope that we have much greater success in organizing. And so uh, I expect our union to be significantly larger. Um, I expect that we will have higher union density uh, within the system. Um, but, I think all, but I think also that, that we're going to have to um, do more outreach to other unions. For example, uh, uh, our friends in Local 251, the Teamsters on the Rhode Island Ho Hospital campus, because we're both on that campus and we're both employees of Rhode Island Hospital. We'll have to learn to have a better relationship, for example, with the hospital in Connecticut that represents Lawrence Memorial. That's four times the Wesley, size of the Wesley Hospital, which owns the Wesley Hospital. So we'll have, to change, uh, we'll have to change our political structures and we'll have to make a better effort and do better by coordinating and working with other unions who have uh, member, represent members in the same systems we have members. Unions, in many ways, have been responsible for providing lots of professional development and opportunity for nurses and allied professionals to grow. Do you, how, how ha, what has the change been like that you watched um, for your members to grow and develop based upon the requirements in their job? Well, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a registered nurse, uh, and uh, boy, what a, what a, a difficult job uh, that is, but um, I would say they're best to speak to that, but, but clearly from an observer's point of view, the skills, the pressures, and the demands uh, placed on uh, healthcare workers in, in, in all lines of work has increased dramatically, and especially with the advances in, in technology. For every advance in technology, you have to have staff that, that, that are, are trained and, and are, uh, can, can use the tech, technology to its maximum. So the, the, um, the, the skill level, I think, is dramatically higher in our membership ranks, say from when I started in, in the early 80s, and, and I would expect that, that trend is going to continue. So really, in many ways, it's interesting to have this conversation because there's no doubt in my mind after talking with you 
that the union is well aware of the changes that are taking place, the changes within the hospitals, the changes within the organizations that they're merging into, the requirements of professional development, and probably the last comment being on how the organized labor, on how UNAP has changed somewhat over the last number of years to respond to the increase in membership that you have and the, and the increase in the skill level that they have. The union itself, I think, is integral to the success of the whole profession. Where would you want it to be? What else do you want UNAP to be able to do to support your members in your future? Well, I think that at the same time, um, making sure that, that uh, our members uh, obtain the skills uh, that, that they need, um, you're also going to see that the setting of where the work is done is going to change. For example, you, you will probably see some out-migration of work from the hospitals into the community. I mean, you've already seen, for, for instance, uh, at Lifespan, they have moved some of the dialysis uh, treatments out into the community. I believe they moved the sleep lab out into the community. Uh, they moved um, some other other services into the community, and rightfully so, where 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 it's such where patients would rather have their, their receive their treatment closer to home if that's possible, and then the hospital responding to that. But by the same token, the union has to be able to respond to representing members in different settings, and and that that's in the examples I gave is not going to be a hospital setting; it's going to be more of a community-based setting. So um, you know that's that's another whole set of challenges is making sure that as, as work uh, is performed in different places in different settings to make sure that that, uh, that work is done uh, uh, by our members. Jack, I really appreciate your, your comments today because there's no doubt um, UNAP over the last 25 years, even less than that because it hasn't been around. How long has it been around? We've 15? been around since 1998. So in that time frame, it's, it's undergone significant change, not only in, in its membership, but in the perception the union has and the support that members need, its members need in the whole transition to larger organizations. And like the last piece that you made comment of, offering those services in a, some facility closer to home. I wanna thank you for taking the time this evening to have this conversation with us because I don't really think that many, many members of the general public have a clear understanding of the supportive role that organized labor plays in supporting its members. Our guest this evening has been Jack Callisey, the Director of Collective Bargaining and Organizing for the United Nurses and Allied Professionals here in Rhode Island. Thank you for this watching this segment, and we look forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you, Bob. The Third Eagle Award this evening will be presented by our very good friend and longtime union activist and organizer, United Nurses and Allied Professionals Director of Organizing and Field Representative Jack Palacci. Joining him is Eagle Award recipient Linda McDonald, one of the founders of United Nurses and Allied Professionals and its president for the past 13 years. Thank you very much. I have to say that I heard Colleen mention that uh, Frank enjoyed a little bit of whiskey from time to time, but I will tell you, I'll bet you 14 to 16 years ago, he was drinking a lot more than that because my son Patrick was in his class for a whole year. Uh, um, but on a, on a serious note, I want to say, uh, Frank, what a great teacher, and I also want to compliment the uh, Cranston teachers. I have three terrific kids, all very successful in life and those successes uh, would not be anywhere near where they are without the Cranston teachers. You guys all did a great job. So it's my pleasure to introduce a terrific labor leader, somebody with a commitment and a vision to organizing that's really unsurpassed. And um, before I talk about Linda McDonald's time in the union, I want to just digress for a moment. You know, before I met Linda, I used to race my car up 95 from bargaining in Westerly in the morning and hitting hit Memorial Hospital in the afternoon and evening for organizing meetings. And in my race up 95, I'd pass that little tiny hospital on the Thurber's Avenue curve and fantasize about organizing it. 
Uh, but 1993, uh, that fantasy became a reality because in the winter of 90, 1993, I met ICU nurse Linda McDonald. And by the summer of 1993, uh, we celebrated one of the largest private sector organizing victories that the labor movement has seen in two decades. And she went on to be uh, the president of the union. She built a terrific foundation for the future success of that local that it enjoys today, a very effective union, a very strong union, uh, and um, a very good record. Now, Linda then became the president of the UNAP, and she brought an unsurpassed vision and energy to the job and put focused all of the resources on organizing. And what a record it is. And I would point out two things that make this really extraordinary. One is the numbers. Uh, on Linda's watch, our union has doubled its membership from 3,200 members to 6,500 members. And that has happened organizing bargaining units as small as five and as large as 600. It's come with bare knuckles brawls with employers in contested NLRB elections, and it's come through very uh, creative and interesting neutrality agreements. Um, the other important element of all this, and it's, and it's often not articulated, is creating the environment in your staff and in your organization to take a lot of chances, to do a lot of different things. Now, in those successes, behind those successes, believe me, there are many failures, many colossal failures, and uh, you don't get good ideas without trying a lot of different things, and you don't get good ideas without stumbling and falling and getting knocked around. And I can't think of a single time uh, where Linda ever said to us, who's the dumb person who come up, came up with that idea? It was always, you know what, it didn't work, let's find something else and, and uh, uh, we'll get at it a different way. Um, I know I speak for my coworkers, the staff, and all the local leaders in, in the great respect we have and the great affection we have uh, for our leader. And I would say, uh, on a personal note, also sympathy for having to supervise the staff that she does, including a couple of brothers who can't even agree on how to pronounce their last name. Uh, I can tell you that we're all looking forward to another 15 years and organizing another 3,200 members. Linda McDonald. Since everybody digressed a little bit before their, their remarks, I just want to say uh, those 20-something years ago, Jack was one of the first labor union people that I ever met. I was not brought up in a union household, although I was brought up in a very left household. And I was a mother, an ICU nurse, and all of a sudden introduced to Jack Callacy of the Kalachi Callacy group. I didn't know the AF of what. I, I, my mentorship began with Jack. We started out at a bar, even though I'm a non-drinker. It's very interesting. And I learned to love this labor, labor movement and know that this is where my heart was, this is where workers' hearts were, and I felt right at home. And it has not been easy, but I love all my brothers and sisters and appreciate um, all of you being here and receiving this award. I also want to thank the Institute for Labor Studies for, for providing education and training to enable working Rhode Islanders and the labor, labor movement to have a stronger voice in the workplace in order to create a more just and equitable society. 
The Institute believes it is important to improve the workplace by adding new skills and knowledge that will assure job security and to participate more effectively in Rhode Island's changing job market. I also want to thank the Institute for recognizing the UNAP and the other labor and community leaders receiving the service award tonight. These are such difficult times for every one of us sitting here. It is great when we come together and celebrate our strengths and commitment to all our union brothers and sisters and the varied membership we serve. It is an honor to be recognized for our contributions to all working people. There is no UNAP local that has escaped the hardships that have been created by the economic recession and the opportunists in this country that are ravishing our members' rights. Unions, union workers, and our contracts are under attack. Our locals have been merged, bought, and affiliated. Our administrators are decreasing our pensions, raising our health insurance, lowering our wages, and changing our benefits. That do more with less attitude is the answer to our budget short, their budget shortfalls. And as we all know, we have a very dysfunctional federal and state government cutting funding for health care and social services. At the same time, they are giving tax breaks to our nation's wealthiest corporations and individuals. I am aware I am preaching to the choir in this group. We do get it. And despite these difficult times, the UNAP has remained committed to advocating for the best possible working conditions for our members and the best possible care for our patients and clients. It has been difficult during the, this time that the UNAP, it, during this time that the UNAP leaders and staff have set out to energize our locals and organize within these locals for greater strength. We came together and we decided we needed to act as one, change how we do business and come together to show our strength and determination. We are all in this struggle together. The strength of this union and all unions is solidarity. Unions were organized during hard times, and a union's courage is built on hard times. If we stand together and show our employers we are united, we will come out of this time stronger and better prepared for better times. So I accept this Eagle Award on behalf of the 6,500 members I represent, a very talented staff, and great local leaders of the UNAP. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m. Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues 
with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Issues. for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Tonight we're going to talk about something that we've talked about on prior shows of Labor Vision, and that is legislation to increase the minimum wage. It's important because even though legislation has passed in prior sessions, it's still an important issue both on the state and national level. And today we're pleased to have the sponsor on the Senate side, Senator Aaron Lynch, joining us. Aaron, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jim. So you were on our show a couple of years ago talking about this issue, but it's staying in the news, isn't I, it? I was, and I, when we talked last time, I think one of the things we discussed at length was how long it had been uh, since the minimum wage, uh, wage had been raised. Since then, um, we've now done it twice, which is nice, um, but you know, we're trying to I think there's a huge difference between the minimum wage and an actual living wage. And I think what we're trying to do um, is you know, pull people up from their bootstraps. There are a lot of people who are making minimum wage who are working you know, two and three jobs as opposed to just one job. There's no secret here um, that somebody making $8 an hour um, is going to be able to support a family. It, it just, right. it, it's not going to happen. So the original intent in raising it um, when we first raised it was, look, that extra, I think it was $14 that the first, you know, per week if you worked mm -hmm. a 40-hour work week. Um, you know, someone could get a pizza, could go out for ice cream, could, you know, we were just looking to to add a little to those people who were struggling. And I think the idea was and the intent was to put it back into the economy. It's helping people so that they're not looking for any kind of other state aid um, and they'd be able to maybe have a little disposable income at the end of the day. And, and it, th that's still the intent and that's still what we're trying to do. I, you know, this year um, the bill is a little different because there's kind of a graduated increase. Um, so it would go to $9 beginning January 1st, 2015, up to $10 January 1st, 2016, um, and then continue to increase uh, in conjunction um, with the Fair Standards Act and the federal minimum wage. So um, it would get recalculated every January January 1st to make sure you know we're still in the ballpark and still you know on the same page. So I, I know that the wage has gone up uh, two different times. Uh, the, just this past January it went up uh, 25 cents Correct. and then the prior January it, it was the first increase. Correct. In I believe it had gone from seven dollars and thirty cents to um, seven dollars and seventy five cents. Mm -hmm. That was that first jump. Um, that was the first time it had been passed I, you know in several years. Right. So uh, the second jump um, was another quarter and I think what we were trying to do was keep ourselves in line with the other New England states. We were still fairly low um, and, and that's what everybody looks to what's Connecticut doing and what's mm -hmm. Massachusetts doing. Um, so now, again, as I said, there's that discussion about whether there's the minimum wage or the, whether there's a the living wage. And I think we're trying to come closer to make you know, the two a little bit more in sync. Um, even at $9 an hour, you're not supporting a family. And, and again, there's no question about that. What we're trying to do is boost the economy and, and those whether it's a kid you know a, a teenager who has that kind of income and is able to then use their money to buy things or um, you know a single mother who can put a little more gas in her car or you know can can buy her kids a tree as opposed to not being able to do that where every dollar helps so it, it's hard um, you know to hear people say things like, well, you know, another dollar or another 25 cents, what's the big deal? It's a big deal to somebody who's making minimum wage. So, um, you know, we're trying to make the economy stronger in every way we can. And I think um, a lot of the research shows that as you increase the minimum wage, it does make the economy stronger. I know I've attended a number of different uh, bill hearings on tax breaks for businesses, tax breaks for the wealthy, and, and the whole idea of generating economic activity and creating jobs is what we all want. What, no matter what side of the political spectrum on, um, we want more jobs in Rhode Island, we want a lower unemployment rate, we want people to be making more money. But in terms of a strategy, you know, I think you know, putting money in people's pockets who live here, 
who are gonna spend their money here, just seems to be the most direct way that we could get Rhode Island's economy back on track. And, and you're right, and that's what we're trying to do. And I, you know, it, it is difficult. Um, you know, there are arguments against it, certainly. Small businesses um, get very concerned because they feel as though they'll be put out of business or instead of hiring, two people, they'll only be able to hire one person. Um, and a lot of the people who have come in to testify, I think we've seen um, that that's not necessarily the case. I think, you know, we'll be able to make it work provided employers are given enough notice. Um, you know, it's, we're really trying to, as you said, um, improve the economy, even if we do it one worker at a time. Um, like, you know, being able to get that pizza at the end of the week or, or take your kids out for ice cream at the end of the week when it was something you couldn't do six months ago will help that pizza place, it'll help that, ice, you know, I don't think someone's going to go out and buy a new car, making an extra, you know, 25 cents an hour, making an extra dollar an hour. Someday they may be able to, though. You know, if they're starting at a higher wage and they can continue, um, you know, to work hard and move forward, it, it, it's always a possibility. And I think that's another thing it does is it gives that person making the minimum wage a little bit more self-worth, a little bit more self-respect. They don't have to rely on someone else and they may not need any state aid and they, you know, um, and I think it gives them a little bit more pride in their work and it makes them a harder worker. Um, so again, the hope is that, um, you know, it, this one piece will help everything else we're trying to do. Sure. Now, this bill this year, you know, is a pretty sizable first year increase. Um, what's the reaction you've gotten on, on, on the bill this year? Do people think you're being too ambitious? Do people appreciate it that you're trying to commingle this thought of a uh, minimum wage with a living wage? Because it's a big jump, and, and this would actually impact a lot more people than the prior January 1st increase of 25 cents. I'm getting both responses, frankly. I'm getting the, this is a little much. We've just, we've done it twice in the last two years. Now we're gonna jump up a dollar and then another dollar. And um, so there is a lot of concern. and, and I have to look not only toward that worker, but toward that person who owns their own small business and who may have a concern, like I said, uh, it, whether it's a seasonal business that they could only hire one employee and not two, or instead of having six employees, they only have five. I don't want someone to lose a job because of this, you know, that would defeat the purpose. Mm -hmm. So I think those are very real concerns. So I am getting that type of reaction, but I'm also getting the other in that, look, $9 an hour is still not enough. $10 an hour is still not enough. Um, and, and those aren't from people making minimum wage. They're from people who are saying, look, I raised my family. I know what it takes to keep the lights on, make sure there's mm -hmm. heat um, and running water, and that's not going to do it. So, um, you, you know, I think that there's a lot of um, sympathy and empathy for both sides. Um, so, you know, I, we're really trying to work hard um, to work you know, both with uh, labor, with small businesses and employers, and see if we can't find some common ground, you know, to keep everybody moving forward. Because in a, a better economy is only gonna help that small business. But the last thing we want them to think is that, you know, we're trying to hold them down or hold them back because there have been such tough economic times the last several years here. They, they sure have. Has it helped at all having the nation's president talking about raising the minimum wage. I know he's got the, a plan to get it up to 10, 10 uh, an hour. Has that dialogue on the national level helped you in your, in your effort to make a big jump uh, this coming year? It certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, it, it has helped to an extent. I think it's also helped that most of the Democratic candidates for governor have all come out and said, we think the minimum wage should be increased. So It looks like they were um, each trying to one-up uh, each other when they were coming out with their minimum they wage. Were, yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And, you know, who wants to get it done faster than, um, you know, the other person? Mm -hmm. And obviously there's some politics being played, you know, in that arena. But I, I do think, um, I, I think the, the president's statements help. I think that the candidates running for governor are helpful in saying that they all agree that it should be done. Um, you know, the question is, can we get it to a point where we can have our, um, you know, small businesses uh, be comfortable with what we're trying to do. Um, so it, the long answer to your short question was it does help, um, but not as much as I would hope only because we here have to deal with what's happening within uh, the four walls of the state of Rhode Island. You know, I, a lot of times you can look to the federal government to say, see, look, they're doing this, um, but there's always a response to that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's helpful. Yeah, I, I know when I'm lobbying on legislation over the years, 
Um, you're right, politicians care a lot more about what's happening in Massachusetts or Connecticut than, than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but Connecticut just made a big move on, on the minimum wage itself. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm hoping that will be helpful with our argument as well, because as you said, no matter what happens, we're looking to see is Massachusetts or Connecticut doing it better or worse than we are. And I also think, um, as a state, I, you know, I was born and raised in Rhode Island. My entire family lives here, um, except for a few. And Rhode Islanders are the hardest on Rhode Island. There's no doubt about it. So everybody is looking to see, are we the worst in this ranking? Are we the worst in that ranking? Are we the best in this? You know, so um, comparing ourselves to Connecticut and Massachusetts, I think, is just an automatic sometimes. So um, I, I think it's a lot more helpful, you know, that Connecticut's making the jump than, say, the president saying that he wants the federal government mm -hmm. to make the jump. I still would put them both within my arguments, but I think it resonates more with our citizens, you know, that look, our neighbor just did the same thing and we're constantly comparing ourselves with them. Sure. So you've already had a, a hearing in the Senate this session uh, on your legislation? We have. Um, th there was a hearing on it and I, I believe the bill's been held so that we can try and work out any kinks there might be and see if we can get those that do oppose it to come around um, a little bit uh, and hopefully we'll be able, you know, to do that before too, too long. I know in, in the most recent prior years, uh, I think the biggest criticism the business community had on the old minimum wage uh, laws, uh, the bills, was the automatic escalator. You know, they, I think they, they worried uh, less about, you know, a one-time jump than they did having something in law that had an automatic increase. Are you still hearing the same thing from the business community this year? Yeah, I, yeah, I think they do have that same concern. But again, as you said, because this is a bigger jump, they have that concern as well. You know, I, the 25 cents, or the original, I think it was 45 cents an hour that we raised it, and then another 25 cents an hour. I don't think stings as much as the dollar an hour this year, dollar an hour next year. So they have a lot of concerns. And, and you know, again, the business owners are just as important as the wage earners, um, and the wage earners are just as important as the business owners. So we do have to balance, you know, the two interests and see if we can, you know, find some common ground where not everybody's always going to be comfortable. Um, but sometimes if both sides don't get everything they want, you know, it's an appropriate compromise. Sure. So I wasn't at the Senate hearing this year. Did any new information, new arguments uh, come out, or was it was it pretty much kind of along the same lines of what we heard in the past, other than the fact that it's a more sizable well, jump? Because it's a more sizable jump, and it has that, as you said, automatic escalator, there were you know those two pieces, whereas in the past, um, the escalator had been put in the bill and then had been taken out because there was so much um, objection to it. So it, it was pretty much the same concern um, that we've been hearing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are things that we're trying to be get, become a little more creative and trying to work out. Yeah. I've heard uh, some women's groups weigh in on, on the minimum wage hike now. Is, is that something that uh, you think all politicians need to pay attention to? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think all groups need to be listened to, but I think a lot of the, you know, the women's groups are very active and and they're around all the time. They're at the state house testifying on you know bills in judiciary and bills in finance and you know they're paying attention and and um, you know any group that pays attention is a group that um, is helpful to have on your side because you know that they're going to do the research and they're going to come up with their statistics and their but uh, you know the bottom line is. Wage earners are wage earners, you know, men or women. But I, you know, I think the concern that I would have, uh, you know, from my other life um, in my private practice of law is I deal with a lot of single mothers, and they're, you know, out there working for minimum wage, and a lot of times it's two jobs to be able to to support mm -hmm. their families and pay, you know, pay for food, and you know, they're seeing their kids less, and they're they're doing a lot of things that they wish that um, they didn't have to do so that they can put food on the table. You know, in terms of having to spare time with their kids or not be able to get to every baseball game or sure. soccer game or school event, um, you know, and it's difficult. And so I think that it is important because that is, you know, a, a demographic that we have to listen to. Sure. So I, I've had uh, Representative David Bennett on the show in, in prior years as well. Are you, are you working with him again this year? Uh, is he your house companion uh, bill sponsor? I am. Um, I, although um, our districts overlap, and I, I, I am his senator, he's not my representative, <laughs> but we are close. Um, 
you know, in terms of both being from the city of Warwick and both, you know, trying to do everything we can to try and boost the economy and try and, you know, to help the average worker. So yeah, we, we talk a lot and we are, you know, fairly close and trying to see, um, you know, if we can work out a compromise and, and, you know, push this forward so we can get it done. Hopefully um, we won't be in session too, too long <laughs> this year, but you never know. You, you never do know. And, and just so that our uh, viewers are aware, those who don't follow it closely, um, if the minimum wage hike was likely to pass, we probably wouldn't see it happen legislatively until sometime in June? Correct. I, if the bill were to pass, it would probably be sometime in June. And then as the bill reads now, it wouldn't take effect until January 1st of 2015. So even if it, even if it passed today, they would see no difference in their paycheck until January of next year. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've got plenty of time, you know, to work on it and try and get it right. Well, I, I hope to have you on the show again in the future talking about yet another uh, minimum wage hike increase, and we'll, we'll see how things go this legislative year. I hope so, too. <laughs> and again, thank you so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and, and um, uh, we're glad to have you. We've got two more minutes, so I want to just uh, you know, give, you, give you an open mic and maybe uh, give you an opportunity to tell your viewers what other kinds of legislation, whether it's worker-related or not, that, that are priorities for Senator Aaron Lynch this year. I think the, the priority for the entire Senate, particularly um, with our leadership, the Senate president, uh, as well as our majority leader, um, is to get Rhode Island's economy back to where it should be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we the Senate, Senate president, you know, unveiled her um, package, uh, her legislative package relative to the economy with her road to work legislation. And I think that it's important for everybody to understand that we understand that this just isn't necessarily um, a lack of jobs or too, the um, minimum wage being too low. You know, we need skilled workers, we need educated workers, we need to make sure that we're looking at every facet of the economy in order to improve the economy. And I think that's something um, that, you know, we are doing this year and we're doing well. We wanna make sure that people have access to education, that they have access to capital. We're trying to make sure that we decrease that um, jobless rate, you know, every month. And it's not an easy thing, but you know, it's something that we've really been concentrating on. You know, since I've been in the Senate, um, it's been a long time now, um, but you know, the economy hasn't been good and, and it wasn't good before I got here, but it's getting, I hope, a little better every year. And I think that with the focus on trying to improve the economy and with everybody working as hard as they're working to try and make sure that we do, you know, what's right by our state, I think it's improving a little bit more every year. I know, you know, people tell stories of being um, in the legislature, you know, back in the 80s and the early 90s, and it was kind of a free for all, you know, money for everybody. And, and when I say it, I mean in that, you know, we were always in the red and not, I, was, I mean, we were always mm -hmm. in the black and not in the red. And you didn't have to tell people no when, you know, somebody came to you to look for more money for a certain project or for example developmental um, disabilities or um, you know neighborhood health right care those types of things daycare um, it was not often that they had to say no I don't think I've been able to say yes very much since mm -hmm. I've been here project you know um, projects and and um, programs are being cut all the time and it's not something that I like to see happen but the reality is the tax dollars weren't there and I think every time we have these revenue estimates things are getting a little better and it's not as bleak as perhaps we thought you know I remember the first couple of budget briefings I went to I, I left thinking I, I don't ever want to be in there again you're almost better off being blissfully ignorant as mm -hmm. to what's going on um, but I think that you know the concentration has been constantly on trying to improve our economy, whether it's through education, it's through jobs, you know, trying to, to get the money together so that we can have all day K, which is something that's been near and dear to both the Senate president as well as um, Chairwoman Gallo's heart. Mm -hmm. You know, those are things that we understand and feel are very important to improving the economy and better preparing our children, our students, you know, for the job, you know, market. Um, we've, we've got a lot of really good resources here in Rhode Island. We have a lot of good higher education facilities. We have great career and technical facilities at the high school level. Um, you know, these are things that we need to utilize. And I think that the Senate president is doing a great job of, you know, trying to tie it all together so we do utilize those things and try and 
put us where we need to be. So you expect to see a whole package of uh, economic related uh, legislation come through the Senate and come through the Assembly this I year? I do. A lot of it has been introduced already, um, but you know, they're, they're always working on more. One of the big things that I've concentrated on since I've been here has been um, to try and cut the red tape, as the President would say, um, but to reduce regulatory reform so that you know businesses can operate, um, people can start businesses mm -hmm. without having to go through the morass of bureaucracy. Um, so you know we're constantly you know getting new bills um, brought to us either by the business community, by the labor community, um, you know to try and help and to try and make things mm -hmm. better. So it's something that we've been working on, and hopefully we'll get a steady stream until we're finished for the year. Yeah, well that would be terrific, and and here's hoping that that year uh, is sooner instead of later, so that you have an actual summer. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, Senator, thank you very much for being generous of your time and, and coming on our show. Thank you. I love to be here. Back in uh, December of 2011, we were in a similar location. Uh, the state had cut $24 million from services and community programs for adults with developmental disabilities. We were in the midst of, of big cuts at these, at these community agencies, uh, including jobs pro pro programs for consumers, a reduction in, in day programs, which wreaked havoc on the lives of consumers, the direct care staff that took care of them, and the families that rely on, on dropping off their adult children so that they can be taken care of and go to work. So the, the campaign continues uh, almost three years, three years later. Uh, we've had some progress. In uh, FY 2012, the General Assembly did restore $9.6 million. And then last fiscal year, the General Assembly restored another $2 million. But yet, that's only a 48% reduction. We have been chronically underfunding our, these services. Um, and it's a big, it's a contributing factor to the recent findings that uh, Rhode Island was in non-compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we're here today to continue to fight for the consumers and the direct care, direct care staff that take care of them, who are really an extension of the family. So I wanted to start off by introducing uh, Senator Lou De Palma, who's put in some uh, uh, quality legislation and has been a champion on this issue for years. Senator. Emmanuel, thank you very much. This is a good day today to be here to address this critical topic. Uh, as he indicated, funding had been cut. We've worked to try to restore that funding over the last couple of years. Nowhere near to where it needs to be. The thanks for all that's going on. Thank you, Emmanuel, for what you're doing. Folks from uh, RIFT with Frank Flynn and Jim Parisi, thanks for what you're doing. But the real thanks go to all the direct care staff that work with those folks on a day-to-day -day basis. As I said, and I uh, sometimes will quote my uh, Senate colleague, Senator Metz, the work you folks do is critical. We're not going to see folks from the DD community up here testifying in front of whether it's Health and Human Services, whether it's HEW on the House side, whether it's finance on the House side, whether it's finance on the Senate side. I feel it's our job and our responsibility, and I feel accountable that we as senators and representatives are their eyes, ears, and voice while we're in these committees and hearing about the issues that are being addressed and we move it forward. Uh, it's critical that we work to do this. All of this is in a backdrop of a still a very difficult economic climate that we have. We're just going through caseload estimating now, revenue estimating. I think we're going to see we have some shortfalls. We'll have to address those shortfalls, but even in light of all those shortfalls, this is a critical task and a critical area that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed now. I encourage everyone as we move forward with this, and we'll have a hearing tonight in Senate Finance at the Rise, contact your representative, contact your senator and representative, implore upon them the criticality, the importance of the issue, and above all, the urgency of the issue. We're here outside the uh, Big Blue Bug where uh, Teamsters Local 251 is looking to organize the workers. And uh, I got Matt Taby with me. He's the secretary treasurer, newly elected secretary treasurer of the uh, Teamsters Local 251. And uh, he's gonna tell us what's going on today, this morning. Well, this morning, um, 
a group of workers here are interested in, in you know, f dignity and respect on the job, uh, and, uh, and decent wages and uh, good working conditions. Um, you know, an icon like Big Blue Bug, uh, formerly New England Pest Control, um, is well known throughout the region, through well well known in Rhode Island, and uh, uh, you know this would. Uh, company like that and a well-known company could kind of set the tone for workers for the economy to say we want to hire people at good wages with good benefits um, but it chooses not to talking about folks that make under ten dollars an hour have been overworked um, they haven't been hiring and that's symptomatic of what's going on in our economy and our country and our in our state that Companies just want to press, press, press for more and more and more and give workers less and have them work harder for it. How many workers um, uh, are looking to organize here? The unit's about, uh, about 30, 34 workers here. And um, Local 251 is stepping in to try to help them organize? 251, um, you know, had gotten a call about it, and there had been quite a bit of a bit of shop floor organizing as it was, um, uh, independent of us. And then we came in and decided that, you know, since they wanted they wanted a union, that we'd be a good fit for them. Everyone sees the bug. Everyone sees it on the highway. Everyone knows it. Um, we're talking about, like I said, you know, 20-year workers that make under $10 an hour. And uh, the industry is, is, the rest of the industry gets paid a lot more, but better, better pay package and better uh, working conditions, and we want to bring them up. And uh, since they're such icons, they should be leaders rather than uh, leaders in the fight for corporate greed. Now, there's also a lot of discussion about minimum wage, a lot of discussion about low-wage workers. How do you see this fitting in with that, or do you see this fitting in with the, that bigger, that bigger uh, struggle? Well, well, I mean, workers should make more. I mean, minimum wage at uh, eight dollars an hour—that's that's poverty nowadays, uh, especially in the Northeast and in Rhode Island. Um, you know, obviously, the easiest, the, the best way. In, in our opinion, for workers to make better wages and actually have benefits that that are, are worthwhile is through unionization, through collective action, staying it together, saying that we as a group want you know a better deal. We put in the time, we put in the work, we make the company successful. So therefore, we should we should benefit from it instead of you know a select few. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.